Welcome. You finally made it. This is Data Leap, and I'm Andrew from Data Leap. Here, we are bringing data science down to earth, dissecting the very obscure field of how to break in to one of the most rewarding, most well-paid industries in the global pandemic and beyond. Today, we are having a new form of content for you. We are going to talk to the esteemed, the legendary data professor about his experience moving from a bioinformatics researcher to professor to data science legend on YouTube. If you can do me a big favor, go ahead and subscribe to his channel right now. I'll give it a second actually, give it a wait. That's enough of a wait. And while you are at it, go ahead and subscribe to this channel right now. If you want to see content exactly like this, where I guide you through the data science world, this is your best chance at making sure you never miss a beat and don't get left behind. And if you like this video, please give it a like. It misses you. This has been Andrew, and I'll see you on the interview chair. Whoosh. <laughs> One eternity later. Hey, Andrew from Data Leap, what's wrong? Oh, oh, hey, I, aren't you the data professor from YouTube? Uh, sorry, I'm not Data Leap. I'm, I'm Data Leap from five years ago when I was too stubborn to teach anybody anything. I just don't think it's possible to learn data science for zero dollars. Wait, you're a professor. You're an associate professor of bioinformatics and you are a data science YouTuber. How would you learn data science all over again if you could? That's a great question, Andrew. And so I think I would do the same thing as I would have already done. Because the thing is, I wouldn't have discovered data science if it wasn't for biology. So actually, that topic was the topic of my very first video where I've gone through how a biologist became a data scientist. And also in the topic of the recent podcast interview that I had with a prominent data science YouTuber, Daval from Code Basics. And so as I mentioned, the reason for why I would stick to the old path that I have already gone through was because if it wasn't for biology, I wouldn't have appreciated what data science has to offer. So starting out from a biology background mm. and being exposed to a lot of biological data set, it made me realize the importance of being able to harness the power of coding and the power of data science via machine learning in order to make sense of data. Being bombarded by big biological data because biology is inherently data intensive has made me view data science in a different light. So I wouldn't have known what would happen if I wasn't in the field of biology. Would I also have the same passion that I have for data science? How did you uh, make the pivot from that field that's not directly data science into the data science field? Did you ever feel there was a glass barrier preventing you from entering data science? So that's a great question. I had my first start in data science back in the year 2004. And it was a time before the term data science was invented by Patel and Davenport which is about eight years later in 2012. And so in my 16 years in data science, I've seen a lot of advancements happening in the field, as well as seeing the exponential adoption of data science by various industries and organizations. So the question is, how did I make the pivot from a non-technical background? So as biology is inherently data intensive, I would have to handle large volumes of data on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, my research involved making sense of how amino acid mutations in the protein sequence would give rise to color changes in the spectral property of the green fluorescent protein from the jellyfish and how to engineer novel colored variants. Because the thing is, the protein structure of the jellyfish is governed by the amino acid and so if we change the amino acid the protein structure will change 
And as a result, the spectral property will also change, meaning that the color will change. And so the question is, why do we need to use the fluorescent protein? Because the fluorescent proteins are very important for many biomedical experiments as it helps to allow scientists to tag and monitor the biological processes of life. And so at first I've used the graphical user interface data mining software, which requires me to point and click, perform discretization, perform binning, classification or regression models. I would click on a series of buttons. And so the Wika software allowed me to build simple linear regression models, decision tree models, backpropagation neural network, support vector machine. And so over time, I discovered that the GUI-based software did not suit my need as much. Because the thing is, it required me to manually click on the buttons in order to perform the data mining process. And so I think I've probably outgrown the GUI software. And so then I started to embrace learning coding. This was my third attempt and my two prior attempts in learning coding failed. So the first one was trying to learn C++ and that didn't work. And then the second one was trying to learn Java and that also didn't work. And so, and so my third attempt was to learn Python. And so that worked. And so after learning Python, I was able to apply it to solve the biological data problem that I have. And by solving and tackling each data problem, I would gain momentum, I would gain confidence in solving each of the small data problem. And over time, by solving hundreds of problems, I would then form this mental map of how essentially the logic of how to tackle the data science problem via coding. So you've transitioned not only into data science, into education as a professor, but you also transitioned into the YouTube world and you're very successful. So I'm wondering at what point did you start moving into the e-learning world and, and what you've gotten out of it so far? So that's a great question. So my journey into the world of YouTube as a content creator started just last year. And actually, I've just celebrated my one year on YouTube a couple of weeks ago in late August. So how did I exactly get started in YouTube? Well, one day my five-year-old daughter suggested that I should have my own YouTube channel. And so that idea probably came from when she was watching some of the cartoons on her favorite YouTube channels. And so that idea lingered with me for a few months. Uh, due to procrastination until I gathered the courage to finally start. And my start did not actually start by pressing the record button on the camera or the iPhone, but my start was also prolonging the procrastination, particularly by creating this condition that I have to buy the gears, I have to buy the furniture, I have to prepare the room, one of the room in my home in order to make it into a studio for recording videos for YouTube. So that took a couple of months, actually like four to five additional months. And so that delayed my start on the YouTube platform. And so if I could turn back the clock, I would probably just hit the record button on my phone. And that would probably allow me to get started on YouTube much faster and learn the art of video editing, the art of getting comfortable on camera, etc. That's awesome. I, I have a question about your teaching style. So when it comes to granularity, right, you don't want to leave out fine details that are important when you're, co when you're explaining a complex subject. But at the same time, when you boil down the essence of the topic, it helps people get more passionate about learning. So how do you make that balance between uh, um, you know, explaining difficult concepts like machine learning and making sure people understand the whole picture? So when explaining complex subjects, I would try to figure out how to simplify the concept. And if it is possible, I would make use of analogies. And so I found that analogies are very effective in allowing us to convey concepts that are rather difficult and complex. So for example, a common analogy used by data science YouTubers such as Kenji and Daniel Bork 
is the comparison of the process of data science to the process of cooking. Cleaning the data is kind of like cleaning the vegetables. Feature engineering is kind of like dicing the vegetables. And the machine learning model building process is kind of like fine tuning the temperature and the exact procedures of cooking the food, preparing the chicken, etc. Similar to what Daniel Bork has mentioned in one of his recent video about cooking the Sicilian chicken. And aside from making analogies, another way would be to make use of infographics as well. So just the beginning of this year, I've experimented with doodling on my iPad and then I made this infographic about the model building process of a machine learning model. And I released that on January 1st. And one of the influencers on LinkedIn posted that or shared that infographic and that one received more than a thousand reactions. And so I figured that people are probably liking that kind of doodle, cartoon doodle. And so that led me to create the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And also on the Medium articles that I have written, I've also made use of some infographic uh, by doodling the various concepts as well in order to simplify the concept that I was trying to convey. Like for example, splitting the data set into 80-20 split. Awesome. I mean, th there seems like there's a lot of free resources and a lot of like ways to start data science. Why do you think, what's the biggest blocker for people from accessing these and, and keeping to a schedule? Why don't people just take advantage of the fact that there's so much to learn? That's very true, Andrew. So currently there are tons of free resources available for learning data science and machine learning. And they're coming from big companies such as Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Kaggle and also online courses from prestigious universities such as MIT, Harvard, on platforms such as edX and Coursera, and so much more. There's so much more. I mean, the, the amount of free machine learning resources is simply overloaded. And so the thing is, when there's so much resources to choose from, it may even lead to this thing called the decision fatigue. Meaning that when you're bombarded with too many options, you're pretty much paralyzed as to which option should you go for. An analogy I would make is, for example, if you want to purchase a smartphone from company A, and company A offers a large selection of models and upgrade options, while a second company, company B, may have only one or two models for you to choose from and only a few options for you. And so consumers may opt for the smartphone from company B partly because it's very simple to make a decision. So you don't have to overthink it because probably they're not even bothered to care about the subtle differences that each of the various models provided by company A has to offer. I mean, the phone offered by company B would just simply be enough for their common usage. And a common scenario and a common question that all aspiring data scientists would have is whether to start coding with R or whether to start coding with Python. And so my advice is to choose one language and put it to use. So what you need to do is start to apply the language to code your end-to-end -end machine learning data science project. And so by doing data science, you will learn data science. And so don't overthink it. Choose one language and continue and reiterate. And once you've gained enough exposure and experience in the language, over time, you'll be able to extend naturally to the second language of your choice. Look, like for example, if you're starting out in R and then through many projects you have gained confidence in using R and you are more proficient in it, then you would probably extend to also making use of Python as well. And I made a couple of videos on how you could integrate R and Python together. And so you could harness the best of both worlds. 
So the question is not R or Python, but the question is, do you want to leverage both R and Python? Okay, I mean, uh, that is a perfect advice. I feel like we, we could plug another thing that's happening right now, Kenji's 66 Days of Data, uh, and do we open the floodgates to the Discord channel uh, today, and we have like hundreds of people from all over the world, Egypt, uh, from South Africa, from uh, you know, from all over India, all over Europe, and they are just making friends, and they're talking about their progress, and and communicating that they're all ready to learn something remotely together. I feel like having a bit of uh, competition, uh, a bit of um, community community accountability. That's kind of like being in school, right? You go to school, especially in especially an MBA, right? You go to school because you're surrounded by people like you. Not so much that you're going to learn the same thing, but you're all learning. That's certainly a great initiative that Ken has started, and it definitely provides a sense of community and also accountability and the learning ambiance and feeling of learning as a group, as we feel when learning in the university, as you have already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly a great time to break into data science by committing at least five minutes a day. And if you are already a data scientist, it's also nice if you could relearn or gain an in-depth study of the existing knowledge that you already have, or also to expand into new areas that you haven't yet explored. And so five yeah. minutes is not a lot of time that you cannot spare. I mean, you could sacrifice maybe five minutes of lunch time in order to quickly read about new data science concepts. As a researcher in academia, I've been pressured to keep myself up to date on recently published paper in my research field owing to the competitiveness in the research area. And so the thing is, I have to read about new research papers on new machine learning algorithms, uh, which are being introduced quite daily. And also how machine learning algorithms are used in the context of computational drug discovery, how machine learning is being used to treat new diseases, what new compounds have been discovered by machine learning algorithms. For example, a few days ago, I've submitted a research paper that I have co-written with a colleague. And so the unique selling point of the paper was the introduction of a bioinformatics web server where we develop in-house. And so traditionally, we would only publish the model, particularly the, mo the model's results. We would show the scatter plot of the prediction versus the wow actual value and see how well the prediction was made and we would probably discuss the important features that are governing the good drugs versus the bad drugs and so the thing is what if other researchers want to make use of that model they cannot because most papers don't share the code and data so our research group have been sharing the code and data for the past 40 to 50 papers that we have published meaning that you could download the code and data directly from our GitHub, and then you could reproduce every single figure and tables from our paper. And so actually, that's also a great way to learn data science. And the thing is, you could download the data, the code, and then you could reproduce it and then read along, read the description in the research paper. And so actually, that's a great idea. I might even make a new video series dedicated to reproducing some of the machine learning papers as well. So probably I'll start with my own research paper, so that would be easiest. And let me know in the comments whether that would be something interesting for some mm. of you. And if so, then we could improvise and make that. Thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you on the internet? So people can find me on my YouTube channel called The Data Professor. And the second place is on mm. Medium. Kenji has recommended that I write some data science articles on the Medium platform by converting some of the videos that I have on YouTube. And so I've taken up that, that advice and written a couple of data science articles on Medium, particularly in the, the particularly in the Towards Data Science publication. 
So if you're into data science, so check out my YouTube channel and also my Medium mm. profile as well. So links will be provided in the video description or in the pinned comments of this video. And most importantly of all, thanks Andrew for having me on this awesome YouTube channel interview. And perhaps we could do some more collaboration video as well. And good luck in your YouTuber journey. Hello, I am Andrew from the near future and I'm here to tell you, thank you. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this video. As a reward, I want to give you a chance to turn your resume into the little peg that fits directly into the slot of cracking the data science interview process in Silicon Valley. Over on Data Professor's channel, I talk very extensively over how to make the perfect Silicon Valley resume. If you want your hands on a copy of the Word document that I used on that channel, then go ahead and go to dataleaptech.com. Input your email and you will get a pristine copy of the Word document. If you want to see how to get to the next step, head on over to his channel because he has a lot of good stuff waiting for you. Once again, subscribe if you haven't already. Please hit that like button and you guys are awesome. Peace. Talking about.